Okay. Cool. All right, everybody. Well, welcome to, I guess what we were just saying is probably our fifth or sixth one of these roundtable conversations. Um, I'm Alexis, if anybody hasn't uh, been involved with one of these yet. So welcome. And if anyone isn't uh, aware of the work of Westar, the kind of tagline is that we bridge the gap between the scholarship of religion and culture. And these conversations are certainly a big piece of that, talking to some of the folks that work with Westar as scholars and bringing that conversation into the public with you all and to, to dialogue and, um, and have, a, have a little bit of a QA and a and time for, for it to be a two-way flow of information. So that's really important to us in the work that we do. So we have Art Dewey and Bob Miller here who are two longtime Westar scholars and authors and professors and have done a lot of working and writing and thinking on all sorts of topics, but um, specifically I think relevant to the topic that we'll be talking about tonight around birth narratives, also relevant to the time of year that we're in, of course, and kind of how we came to get the story that we have now and where that comes from, from the Gospels and um, through a lens of history as well as, as the text and all those sorts of different pieces. So um, Art and Bob, I will hand it over to you and let you guys say what you want to say for the first little bit and then we can kind of enter into more of a dialogue and, and Q&A time. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, I'm gonna just start uh, with a few, Art and I are both gonna make opening statements which covers some general t terrain and then Art and I will exchange with each other for a bit and we'll have plenty of time for input from our participants. So uh, the first thing I'd like to say about the birth stories in the Bible is that just about everybody is exposed to those stories long before they're able to read them and they receive them through the cultural uh, thing that we call the Christmas story. In the manger scenes and baby Jesus and the three kings and all of that. And of course, the idea that, there's, that there is such a thing as the Christmas story is a blending of two quite distinct narratives in the gospels. The birth of Jesus is mentioned in only two gospels, um, Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. And if you read them by themselves, without putting in information from the other one, you find out that they're quite different in what, they're, what they say, and they don't have a whole lot in common except the basic, basic story about a birth. Just about all the details are, are quite distinct, and those distinct details are clues as to what the gospel writers are trying to communicate. So I'm gonna start off with giving a very brief overview, uh, just maybe four or five minutes, of the birth story in Matthew's gospel and then hand it off to Arthur. It's very important when reading Matthew is to understand that Matthew is a Jew writing to other Jews. At the time of this gospel, there were no such things as, as a, there was no Christian religion. There were followers of Jesus and the ones that Matthew's writing to are, are Jewish. And so he's writing in Jewish language using Jewish uh, allusions uh, working on Jewish notions that he assumes his audience will share. And as we look at that back 20 centuries from our time, and oftentimes over the fence of a different religion, it takes a bit of groundwork for us to be able to understand what Matthew is trying to communicate. And once we get a handle on that, we realize that this story is, is far, far from being the way I learned it as a child. Mm. It's not a children's story at all. In fact, mm -hmm. Matthew's story of the birth of Jesus is very dark and grim. I mean, there's a murderous king who tries to kill Jesus. Jesus escapes, but babies are killed. Mm -hmm. And this is a sad story in, in some ways, and ones that really perhaps we ought to think again about exposing children to, because it contains mm -hmm. some quite disturbing stuff. Essentially, what Matthew is trying to do in these first uh, stories in, in his gospel is to establish for his audience that Jesus possesses the proper credentials to be the Jewish Messiah. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that a Jewish Messiah was generally supposed to be was to be a descendant of King David. This is a problem for Matthew's <laughs> gospel because in Matthew's gospel, the father of Jesus is unknown. It just simply says it gives the long genealogy of Jesus from Abraham to King David, 
But when he gets to the actual parents of Jesus, he does not say that Joseph is the father of Jesus. He says Joseph is the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And since pedigree comes through the father, this is a problem. So it's been a problem for how can we explain that Jesus is descended from King David if there's no biological link back to David, mm -hmm. okay? The way he does that is by having this really terrible dilemma that Joseph is in. He's halfway through his marriage. He's betrothed, which is a formal marriage. He's about to take the second step, which is to complete his marriage by taking the woman into his home. And he discovers that she's pregnant and he's not the father. Hmm. And he receives a dream. I'm sure everyone knows the story. In which an angel tells him, go ahead, complete your marriage. Don't be afraid. This child is of God. Hmm. And he says, you shall complete your marriage to his mother and name him Jesus. And when Joseph does that, when he does those two things, when he completes his marriage, when he accepts the woman into his home, and when he bestows a name on this child, he is officially claiming paternity. That's how one did it in the ancient world, is when a, when a father names a child, that child becomes his, despite its, whatever its biological or, or his child and entitled to his inheritance. So this is how Matthew, is able to convince or at least make the case that Jesus, even though he's not biologically descended from David, is legally descended from mm -hmm. David and thus fulfills that very important criterion. The other thing that is supposed to, was probably supposed to be for a Messiah, was he should be born in the city of David, in the town of mm -hmm. Bethlehem. This was a problem for all the early Christians because Jesus was not known as Jesus of Bethlehem, but rather right. known as Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And so in Matthew's telling of it, uh, it's clear that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And for very dire reasons, the family has to flee to save the life of the baby. They go to Egypt. And when they come back, an angel tells uh, Joseph, don't go back to Bethlehem, go north to Nazareth. And that's how Jesus is known as Jesus of Nazareth, despite being born in Bethlehem. So what Matthew is accomplishing mm -hmm. here is setting some very strong markers down in order to make the case that Jesus, despite the appearances, fulfills the credentials to be Messiah. Mm -hmm. In the next episodes that happen after his birth, the fleeing to Egypt, uh, the return to the land of Egypt, the escape from the murderous king, all of these are Jesus reliving major events in the history of Israel. Mm -hmm. Just like Moses escaped the murderous king in Egypt, Jesus escapes the murderous king in his own country. Just mm -hmm. as Jesus, uh, just as the people of Israel had, had to go into exile, so too does Jesus as an infant go to Egypt. And Jesus also leaves Egypt just like the people did at the time of the first Passover. So Matthew's mm -hmm. showing that Jesus not only is the Messiah, but that in his, in his own little life, just in the first year or so of his life, he has recapitulated in his own little biography all the major events mm -hmm. of his people. And thus he kind of embodies what mm -hmm. Israel is and is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll let Art take us into Luke's <laughs> Okay, all right, take it away. Okay, that was great, Bob. Uh, the Lucan material is is different, uh, but in many respects, many things that I'll say are similar to what Bob said. But let me just uh, go back a minute and say that the uh, there's there are some assumptions that people make in the first century about who is special and who isn't, yes. and one of the things that the ancients did was if somebody was considered special, they had to account for where did it come from? Where did this, this capacity come from? Where did this power mm -hmm. come from? And the only way they could understand that is that it had to come through the intervention of the gods. Mm -hmm. So this, this is very, very important. Uh, when you look at birth stories throughout the ancient world, they're all about people who are considered distinctive, curious, beyond the average, 
And the only way they can account for that is that somehow the gods get into it. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me for a second. All right, all right, here we go. Um, the, the Luca material is, is a curious one because it, it does a number of things. And it also contains um, the possibility that there was a prior text and a text is maybe coming from the followers of the Baptist, the baptizer, namely the uh, material about his birth and the, you might say, the miraculous intervention about that. Uh, mm -hmm. As it stands right now, it forms sort of a diptych. You have what happens to the Baptist parents and then what happens to his parent, and you have interventions by angelic figures on both sides. Um, the, the effect, of course, is to say that Jesus is, the whole situation surrounding Jesus is much better than John's, particularly because Zacharias does not respond adequately and fully, whereas Mary does. Um, but there's something else going on. And what's going on is that the, um, there are political implications that are found here. Whereas in the Matthew text, there's a, a political implication vis-a-vis -vis Herod. The, the political implication in, um, in uh, Luke is, is vaster. And that is to say, mm -hmm. it's now moving away from Israel, but it's moving into the empire. And that's why the census is mentioned at the beginning of the second chapter. And uh, also the note of the shepherds, as well as the angelic visitors, a heavenly host, an army, uh, also suggest uh, things that we'll get into in regard to the intimations vis-a-vis -vis the what it means to be an emperor and who is important and the things that accompany the birth of an emperor. Um, Bob said that uh, the Matthew text is not for children. I don't think this is really for kids either in the sense that it's in some ways a very seminal political contra story against who is the, the most important being in the world um, and it ain't in Rome any longer. So I'll stop there and we, let's discuss. Okay, well, Bob, did you have anything you wanted to say back between the two of you before I can I can ask a few questions and facilitate discussion? Just to add a few, a few details to fill in art uh, that the uh, story in Luke is very consciously crafted in order to imitate uh, the kinds of things that would happen around the ascension of a new emperor. For example, right. it was commonly believed in the Roman Empire that some sign in the heavens, a great comet or a, a new star mm. would appear when a new king was about to take power. Mm. And that's, you know, that's, all, that's in Mark, that's in Matthew's gospel, but you see he's kind of, he's ringing that bell a little bit too in that yeah. way. In mm. uh, Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus is very, is quite emphatically uh, called the son of God. And we take that for granted. But in the Roman Empire, the emperor was known as the son of God. And so calling Jesus that is a direct claim upon imperial right. might. And then also, uh, there is some rather famous uh, celebratory inscriptions around the Roman Empire in cities that sort of uh, flatter the emperor. And one of them is quite remarkable. It's about the emperor C Caesar Augustus, who was there when, at the lifetime of Jesus, and it says this, it says, the birthday of the God marked the mm -hmm. beginning of the good news for the whole world. Mm -hmm. And by yeah. the God, they mean the, em the emperor. Yeah. And so Luke mimics that language. This is what the angels sing in the song when they herald the birth of Jesus. They bring good news to all the world. And uh, Roman readers would not miss these kind of connotations, that this is an attempt to set Jesus up quite consciously as, uh, I would say, 
competing with the loyalty owed to the emperor. Yeah. 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 That's why it kills me when people say like, oh, the, the gospels are not, you know, Jesus wasn't political. The gospels are not political. And I'm like, ah, right out of the gate. You have just the implication and the way that the story was even written. Right. That is interesting. Yeah. 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 If you, if, if you for example, if you read Virgil with the, uh, with some of his poetry, the fourth Eclogue particularly, you find out that you get imagery of shepherds. You get imagery mm -hmm. of True. of uh, you know the, the the poor folk as it were and this is associated with the new age and the coming of the savior and the coming of the one who was going to bring the new age of course that's augustus caesar mm -hmm. and here you have a retelling of it but it's it's not happening in the right place it's happening in in the uh, you know in palestine or in israel it's happening among shepherds who are near dwells who are not roman shepherds um, it's just the wrong place, the wrong time, the wrong people. And that's exactly the force of the narrative that you have the nobodies asserting themselves in, and, and they, they're taking on imperial air. They don't have the imperial robes, but they, they have the imperial airs as it were. And they've got the chorus. It's a whole chorus line of kicking ancestors. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess yeah. my, my, my question to maybe kick it off, the Q&A part is, so what are your thoughts about how we got this all mashed together then? Like between the two stories and there being kind of this desire to get at both of them, but then end up with this kind of this story that as you guys have both said, or it's not really like a kid friendly story, but yet somehow we've, I mean, I guess the, I guess, We've, we've simplified it in a lot of ways, but even getting to the point where these things got mixed together, what are your thoughts about how and why that happened, if you have any? Well, it takes place over time. And, and indeed, it's, for example, you, you can blame uh, Francesco, Francis of Assisi, for putting animals mm. in. Uh, <laughs> I mean, real animals, too. Uh, I mean, the whole crash is a medieval construct. And, mm. um, and what we have, in the Christmas story today is really it's it's convergence and a coalesce, a con, really a a whole hodgepodge of so much, and it just shows what the cultural imagination can do. It's it's remarkable, um, but putting all these things together uh, sometimes allows people to think that they always were there from the very beginning, and. What we are saying is that, first of all, these stories are some of the, the youngest stories in the New Testament. They're, they're not old. They're, they don't go back to the beginning. Um, they're, they're, they're put into Gospels that are not the earliest Gospels. Yeah. And uh, uh, they're done, in, in some ways, the, the people who are telling these stories are working backwards. They're mm -hmm. saying, because Jesus is special, he must have been special all the way right. and that would include his birth. Right. It's almost like reverse engineering it a little bit. Like, how do we fit? Yeah. If this is the end goal but that the, we believe about yeah. Jesus, how do we make that show up early yeah. on? Yeah, but this is how you do it. I mean, this is how they, what they do to Alexander. This is what they do to Augustus Caesar, for example. It always works mm -hmm. backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I've noticed, I noticed you already have like a little side conversation going in the chat, I think related to the comment I made about the people, it's, I can't, I'm always shocked when people say that the gospel, gospels are not political. And someone asked like, are you saying that the gospel writers were politically motivated? And we've already got a few people responding yes. And then how would that benefit them? And so any thoughts that you either of you have around any, well, what may have been political motivation for the way that these things got written down? Politics is not separated from theology. Right. They're all seen together because they're all dealing, for the ancients, they're dealing with power. They're dealing with what constitutes meaning and power. And um, it works out. And, and today we would call that political, but they would not see that. The mm -hmm. emperor, as Bob said, is called a son of God. It's on the coinage. Is that political? Is that theological? It's both. You can't separate these things. 
Um, so. Perry has a good point. One thing that might be helpful, I guess I um, didn't set this up initially, but talk if either of you could talk a little bit about the dating of these gospels, because that's the other piece of it too. It's not, it's not, these stories took time to be in the form that they then are written down in. So if you want, could you talk a little bit about that, about that and how they kind of came to be the way that we have them today? Uh, I could say something about that. I mean, it's very difficult to date these works with any uh, precision because they don't come with publication dates on them. <laughs> uh, you, you have to infer from any kind of stray comments they might make about events that we can verify outside the Gospels. And there are just very, very few of them. So, uh, I mean, scholars who've worked at this and come up with ranges of decades, really, and the Gospel of Matthew is typically dated to the 80s or 90s. The same for the Gospel of Luke. Uh, new studies may push us into accepting a later date for Luke. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're talking about a good uh, 50, 60 years after the birth of Jesus. And there's a very clear indication in both Matthew and Luke that the birth stories are afterthoughts. Because if you finish the birth stories, you turn to the next chapter and you get into the John the Baptist material, which is where Mark's gospel, the earliest gospel, starts. And you, they look just like they're starting over again, like it's a new <laughs> beginning. So it's clear that the stories had a certain shape. And then later on, uh, you know, as the stories were, as the Gospels were developing, the birth stories were added to at 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 the beginning, much the way uh, Art said, is that people reason that since Jesus was the Son of God, uh, after his resurrection, he must have been a Son of God from all 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 along, and in some ways, these these both in both Gospels, both for Matthew and for Luke, these stories about the birth are designed in a way like an overture to an opera is designed. It contains all the themes that are going to be developed later in the gospel. So they're very consciously literary crafted pieces to introduce readers to the central themes of the, of the gospels. And, and, and to loop back to the politics and religion thing, in the ancient world, there was no difference between the two. I mean, kings were thought of as either being God or appointed by God. The will of the king was the will of God, and there's just, there's just no way to separate those things. And so to talk about God is always, always, always everywhere in the ancient world to talk about politics. There's simply no way around that. I would say the same is true today, but we have kind of elaborate uh, uh, intellectual structures which prevent us from seeing that as, as clearly as they did in the, in the, in the ancient world. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So we have texts that are like half a century plus after the death right. of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, I think like sometimes I know for me, you think, oh, in the scope of like thousands of years, you're like, oh, 56 years. But when you think about like, okay, so that would have been, you know, I think about how, you know, far along, far away 50 years ago is from now and, and things that people wouldn't have even seen, you know, that they're trying to potentially be writing. And if you put it in more of a here and now sort of context, for me anyway, it really makes it, you think like, oh my God, and, and here we are like trying to take these all at, you know, literal face value when it was probably people that hadn't even seen it, that had heard through these stories and et cetera, et cetera. So that, yeah, that really puts it in perspective in a lot of ways. I mean, a, a very interesting clue is that very interesting is that Matthew and Luke have such different outlines to their stories. I mean, they, all they have in common really is the names of Joseph and Mary, yeah. uh, the city of Bethlehem. They have very different stories about how Jesus gets born in Bethlehem because in Matthew, mm -hmm. uh, he's born there because that's his hometown. Whereas in Luke, they have to go there from Nazareth on this weird uh, imperial decree that people move to their take a trip. <laughs> Right, so someplace else, but which, which just simply made no sense, which was never no. any time in the empire. Uh, and and the fact that the stories have so little in common tell us that there wasn't a common memory circulating about his birth. And why would there be? Why would anybody know anything about that until after Jesus was was famous? And so yeah. any attempt to recover biographical uh, memories from when he was an infant would have been pretty hopeless, I think, at the time. And they would have had some of the facts, right? Where he was born, who his parents were, et cetera. But that's really about all they, all they have in common. Yeah. These stories get pushed together 
uh, in the Christian imagination because that's how almost everybody appropriates the Bible. It's they hear it, they piece it together in mind. Perfectly natural process happens in every religion, to every literature, everywhere. Uh, this 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 thing about reading gospels strictly separately is a highly cultivated, if you will, kind of artificial skill that scholars have learned to do and try to teach their students to do. Because we can learn so much by doing it that way, but it's not how the Bible was treated. That's right. In, in the Christian churches, and, and there's no reason why it should be. Really, I think. Yeah. All right. Anything you want to add? I think Bob is making some very good points. Uh, the, the, the difficulty actually comes in uh, when you get the likes of the two of us coming aboard and saying, let's separate things out. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's you know, divide and conquer, let us see the layers. But in fact, what has happened in terms of the, the Christian tradition is that people have just amalgamated stuff. Yeah. Together and together. It's very eclectic. And yeah. there are, there are good points and there are bad points to that. Um, you know, there are variations of the of the Christmas story. Christmas, for example, Dickens' Christmas Carol, in some ways, is another gospel. Uh, this is this is another way of reading the Christmas story. So, the the difficulty is, you know, say, well, wait a minute, now that's fiction. Well, these are also fiction. And then, and then and people say, well, if it's fiction, therefore it's not true. And that's, first of all, the word fiction doesn't even, right. as opposed to fact, doesn't, that distinction doesn't work in the ancient world. The word fact didn't even exist until the 1600s. And the way we understand fact is associated with the 19th century and an empirical cast of thought. So when you go back to an ancient text, you don't look for facts, you look to see how it's woven. And for example, in the, in the Luke image, you see that this person is very, very aware of the Jewish scriptures in Greek. And he knows how to write these things very, very well. And he's writing for an audience who also would appreciate that. Um, but he's not interested in giving us 2000 years later the facts. He's interested in telling the story that has meaning. And indeed, the ancients tell stories precisely to give an insight through a pattern. And that's crucial for anybody who understands ancient texts. They, um, even Thucydides, when he writes history, uh, will give us um, a chapter on the Spartans' deliberation in the Peloponnesian War. Well, Thucydides was an Athenian. Where, how did he get in? Well, he didn't. Did the Spartans keep notes? No. So how did he do it? He made it up. Yeah. And he says at the beginning, he was going to give us what was likely to have occurred. He wants to give you an insight into the Spartan character. He's doing what the Greek playwrights did. In fact, he is creating a tragedy of the war between Athens and Sparta. But he's giving an insight, just yeah. as the writer of the Gospel of Luke Matthew is giving an insight into what does this Jesus mean? And that's, yeah. that's what's really going on there. I love it. It reminds me of that Marcus Borg. I think it was Marcus Borg quote, or at least attributed to him in some sense that um, the Bible is true and some of it actually happened. <laughs> Something to that effect. Like, you know, there's, there's truth. Um, and Perry reminded me of a Bob Funk idea too, like true fiction, you know, there's well, what, what what they mean by truth? I mean, first we we immediately associate truth with fact. That's a modern assumption and right, equation. Right, right. Nobody in the ancient world associates truth with fact. They associate truth with an insight. And where do you get truth? You can get in truth in any sort of a pattern or any sort of a story. And that's the yep. ancient, and that in fact is what is going on in both of these tales. These are the midrash. Right. This is a is a, a weaving of materials to find out some sense and that's what's going on here uh, it's mm -hmm. it's closer to a um, uh, a, a, um, a woven garment than it is a videotape let's put it that way yeah yeah so I've been trying there's been some good discussion happening in the chat um, if anybody has questions, I'm trying to kind of keep up with it. Uh, so I don't want to like 
I don't want to get in the middle of the discussions that folks are having among themselves, which is awesome. Um, but if, if people have questions, go ahead and, and type them in the chat and I will be paying attention to that and try to, to get to some, if not all of them. Um, let's see, I'm looking at some of the things that was sent through email as well. Actually looks like we've kind of touched on, um, on a lot of these already, but one, of, one about kind of the differences between Matthew and Luke, which you guys have definitely hit on, but um, if you could maybe talk a little bit about their audience, like Bob, I know you started talking a little bit about that, but it, maybe e either or both of you could say a little bit more about the likely intended audiences for these gospels and, and thus how some of this stuff would have ended up a little bit different in these two different gospels. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Matthew assumes a, uh, a familiarity with the Jewish Bible. He, he's going to drop allusions that he just knows his audience is going to get without him having to explain it. For example, I mean, the one I mentioned, if you think about it, it's pretty obvious that if you know the story about Moses as a baby, and the Pharaoh gave the order that all the Israelite males were to be killed as babies, and his sister and his mother collude to save him by making this little basket and float him down the, down, down the Nile, and he mysteriously gets, ends up being raised by the Pharaoh's daughter and that, that beautiful story. Well, it's a very similar, it's the same really uh, theme actually, when the king in Matthew's gospel orders that all the babies under two years old in the region be killed. And then an angel warns Joseph to flee with the family. And where do they go? Well, they go to Egypt. And that's just got Moses written all over it, that one baby is saved who becomes the leader of his people. Mm -hmm. So Matthew just assumes that. Furthermore, in the first uh, two chapters of his Gospels, where the birth stories are, he quotes from the, the Jewish prophets five times and, uh, under, and knows his audience would get what's going on, is that he's presenting a very concentrated series of stories in which Jesus fulfills these prophecies, such showing him to be the rightful <coughs> of the history of Israel. And uh, once again, he's making the case that Jesus, um, despite appearances, right, is the Messiah, because uh, Jesus did not impress his Jewish contemporaries as a Messiah, because he didn't act like one. He didn't do anything the Messiah was supposed to do, not one thing. And so when he died early in his career under horrific circumstances, um, the followers of Jesus had to really assume a big burden of proof to make the case that Jesus was a Messiah, although not in the style that we were hoping for. And so you see this elaborate preparation that Matthew's laying there in chapter one and uh, chapter two of, of his gospel to get his audience ready for that. And as, as you probably know in Matthew's gospel, his first major speech is what we call the Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus speaks from the top of a mountain. Uh, you, there's Moses again, right? Giving the law from mm -hmm. the top of the mountain. So this, this is a Jewish gospel from beginning mm -hmm. to end. And the only way to understand it in its original intent is to saturate yourself within that Jewish environment as, as best you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, you have anything yeah. you want to add? Well, let me just throw Luke out. Luke is a little bit more complicated. Uh, for years, people have assumed that the audience was more non-Jewish. But in fact, um, I'd say from 1970 or so, there's been a recurrence in thinking that, in fact, it's at best a mixed audience, that the and perhaps people in Asia Minor, uh, but it was a mixed audience. That What does that mean? It means that there were Jews and non-Jews. Why they why do they make that claim? Be precisely because of the style of the writer. That who would be interested in somebody imitating the Septuagint style mm -hmm. if, they, if they didn't know about it? And why would they yeah. want it and all that? So there, there's that. Uh, but there's also indications that this is not just a Jewish audience. So you've got both happening, and it's, it's a very mixed community. And the dating, uh, as Bob pointed out, anywhere from 80 to, I would say, 115. It's that wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about, I think we've touched, you've touched on this in some capacity, but there's been a couple of questions around this. So I just want to raise it um, around the social, specifically social political context for these birth narratives. So we've talked in kind of around that a little bit, but do you have anything that you could say to address that head on? Um, if these are political, you know, if there were, were no, if there was no separation, right, between, between religion and politics, and if, these contexts are, as you guys have described, where, I guess, where does kind of like the, the social political location fit into that? Well, I, I think one of the ways to ex look at this is, is to look at something completely different. That is to say the Arch of Titus. Here you have an arch constructed uh, honoring the Emperor Titus. And it's, it's a very interesting piece. He's now dead. Titus was the man who was in charge of the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, his father having gone to Rome to become emperor. Um, but if you go through the arch of Titus, on the right-hand side of the inside of the arch, you see Titus in a triumphal chariot. If you look to the left, you see soldiers carrying the spoils from the temple of Jerusalem. Mm. including the menorah and taller scrolls, things like that. But if you look up at the very underneath of the arch, there is Titus on, on, on the back of an eagle going to heaven. Mm. That's his ascension. Mm. And indeed, that's how the, the gospel of Luke ends with Jesus also ascending. So mm. the, the, the interesting thing is that the, even the emperors were playing these games they knew that to speak of power, to speak of who won and who lost, because the Arch of Titus basically says, our gods are better than their gods. We won. In fact, we're taking your God's stuff and we're putting them in a temple and we're going to show you that mm. we won. And, and, and so the Arch of Titus may well have been constructed around the same time as the Gospel of Luke was being written. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because there you have the scene of a baby being serenaded by an angelic army uh, to basically in the, uh, you might say, in the, um, in the terms of the fourth acologue of Virgil, saying that this is, no, this is where the real emperor has, has been born. This is, this is where it is. So you, you've got these competing uh, voices, these competing visions of what does this might mean and what, what is that all about? Yeah. And you might say, are they, the, you know, they're both fictions in one sense, but the fall of Jerusalem is quite real as, you know. <laughs> let, me, let me add something to that, Art. You just reminded me of, of uh, that verse in loose gospel, when you use the word army. Yes. Because the word there in Greek for the angels is a military term. It says yeah. the, uh, the whole troop, and we tra the whole troop of the heavenly army, the whole yeah. multiple, the whole legion. Yeah. The word, the word host in English, the often translated is the host of heaven. Host yeah. is from the Latin word hostia, which means an army. Yeah. And what you have Luke doing is portraying a, uh, a military uh, like a military band to yes. play music for the new emperor. Yeah. No, it's not the emperor in Rome, it's to a baby born yeah. on a trip on the side of the road or someplace like that. And the people getting, getting the message are the poor. I mean, just the, 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 just the cast offs mm -hmm. of society. It's just the perfect mirror image that yeah. Luke wants to challenge his readers to ask the question, yeah. you know, where do you see real power do you see it yeah. in rome or do you see it in the loser jesus right mm. it didn't amount to anything apparently or most people thought yeah no so it's it's an extremely challenging message yeah and again one that children won't get and it's appropriate yeah. for kids you know to enjoy the pageantry of it that's how children learn but these are adult stories and they and they really deserve to be uh, appreciated as such yeah. yeah, for example, well, I, oh, we, we sing the song, Angels We Have Heard on High. Yes. What, what we're missing is that's the Luftwaffe. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's going on. You know, you're looking at the, 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 
this is this is London looking ahead over you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not by accident that everyone in the in the gospel who who meets an angel is terrified. Yeah, because they're they're scary they're scary guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's interesting all the all the contextualization and some folks have raised this, so I'm I'll bring it up. Um, like, what? Where did we lose that? If all this these stories are written in relation to the other story, you know, myth stories that were written about all the other leaders at this time. And, you know, it's part of a piece of the context and all this sort of stuff, like, and, and the, the pageant version isn't the, the real mm -hmm. quote unquote version. Like, when did we start just getting the pageant version, you know, cause it's not just kids that get the pageant version. It's kind of like, you don't really grow out of that in a lot of places, unless you've come into it yourself but that isn't what is often taught um beyond the pageant years so i'm interested to hear what you guys i don't know just opinions about kind of how that came to be the case well i it's not terribly surprising that you know most people's appropriation of their own tradition and the bible specifically in this case would be in a very simple way I mean, very few people give conscious attention to thinking critically and doing uh, something as artificial as, you know, studying historic, historical background to these, to these stories. I mean, most people don't even know how to ask those kinds of questions. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not sure. surprised yeah. that, I mean, in virtually every level of human culture, you find that most people appropriate it simply in their pores and not enough by studying it. Yeah. And of course, you're going to emphasize in those sorts of conditions the elements that make people feel happy or blessed or protected or whatever. And you're, it's very rare that people actually welcome uh, challenging material from their uh, religions. Right? They mostly want to feel like they're being protected, sure. blessed, <laughs> told they're doing good, uh, and comforted. And those are perfectly appropriate, natural human human desires. It just seems that, in my judgment, Jesus wasn't too interested in providing that, except to the people who were right. beaten down and thrown away as human garbage in their own culture. Yeah. 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 Anything else Art, to add to that? Well, I would say that we, we forget that we are naturally storytellers, and that no matter what we absorb we also fabricate and that's not a bad thing this is how we survive as human beings we we have to tell stories in order to find meaning so that's that is just given uh what a critical awareness does is to say maybe we need to see where these stories come from maybe there are layers to these stories maybe these things are conflations and what happens if we begin to separate out some of the stuff what happens and what happens is that you begin to see that there are deeper stories and mm -hmm. that, that even people in the first century, as Bob was pointing out, they're taking, they're taking older stories and they're now retelling them because now they've got somebody new to talk about. And so the story shifts. And, uh, and these are human beings who are trying to make sense out of things just as we're trying to make sense out of things. So I don't want to uh, denigrate where it's gone. I just want to distinguish and to see that, in fact, we might be actually unfair to the past if we simply collapse everything together. Um, yeah. You know, if you think about people uh, have experimented with what they call family resemblances of photographs, where they, they take a family of eight, and of children, eight children, and they take photographs of each one, and then they combine them all. And there is, as they say, a family resemblance. They all seem to have this look, but then if you separate it out, they're really different kids. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, they, they all look the same. And, and we tend to amalgamate things very quickly, and, um, and that's fine. But, you know, for example, if you were in, in the, on the witness stand and somebody would cross-examine you, they could easily take this apart uh, if they knew what they were doing. And mm -hmm. our memories are slippery, are very slippery. Right. And, and we, and in fact, it, we've 
Freud, as well as others, have pointed out that our memories actually are creative. They're not, they're not in, in somatic cameras. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but the pageantry is an interesting thing because that's a very medieval thing. And part of the reason oh, yeah. for that is people could not read. The Bible is not right. read usually in the Middle Ages. They, they had Bibles, but they would change uh, to stands, pedestals in the churches. But the people didn't read them. People were told mm -hmm. stories mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. through storytelling, through pageantry. And the pageantry combined some of the best images. That's what you did with the pageant. And yeah. um, it, very, it's very, then it becomes very influential because people see it, they enact it. You know, if, if you're a shepherd in a play, well, the, those shepherds are definitely real because why? You you put on the shepherd's clothes. Mm. Yeah. What about Mary? What about, I've I've gotten an interest. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Did you have something else you wanted to say? Uh, no. I mean, well, okay. We we okay. should talk about Mary because okay. yeah. in Matthew's gospel, she's there. She never says anything. Nothing is ever said to her. She doesn't do anything. All she does is give birth to Jesus, and not even in the story. It's done off camera, as it, as it were. Mm -hmm. I mean, we heard that, that uh, you know, Joseph took her into his home and named the boy Jesus, and there's no, there's no <laughs> actual birth scene. So Mary's like a non-person. Uh, yeah. in, Math in Matthew's gospel, I mean, she's there, but it's entirely told through the perspective of Joseph. Now, Luke, the story is actually told from, at least in part, the perspective of Mary. And so we get a rather different uh, uh, sort of characterization. She becomes a character, really, in the story yeah. there. And she's the one who receives a visit from the angel telling about the miraculous birth, whereas in Matthew, it was Joseph. Uh, and so it's pretty clear that, uh, well, at least in the, in, the, in the Mythian story, she's simply on the sidelines there. Uh, Art, can you say more about Mary's role in Luke's gospel? Well, I, I think the first thing to think about is the, how young she must have been. I right. mean, we're talking about a 13, 14 year old girl. Hmm. If, if, if any, you know, if this is real, then it's 13, 14 year old girl. And she is evidently unwed, un, you know, unmarried. And, and, and so we've got the problem of shame. And that's certainly a biggie in Matthew. That's a biggie in Matthew. Uh, in, hmm. in, in Luke, she brings it up. You now, what's going to happen? Right. I don't right. know a man. You know, what, and, and all of a sudden, the angel says, don't worry about it. God will solve it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that, again, that shows the divine power. Um, so uh, Mary, uh, also the figure of Mary is contrasted with the figure of Elizabeth. And mm -hmm. the figure of Elizabeth is contrasted with the women in the Hebrew scriptures who have had problems bearing children. Mm -hmm. So you've got this this very interesting staccato effect of women having problems delivering or having a baby, and then Mary, who mm -hmm. is <laughs> surprised by the whole event. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very it, it sort of a, it it sort of changes the the rhythm as it as it were, but that's well, part of the contrast mm -hmm. Jesus' birth. And the things surrounding it with John the Baptist's birth. Yeah. Well, and you also get I, one of the folks raised this the um, you know the Magnificat hymn um, yes. as sort of these words put into Mary's mouth that are very insightful and profound. Um, very political. And yeah, exactly, exactly. And so there's yeah. an, it's an it seems to me not as a scholar of the gospel, but that there is something interesting about a writer, ostensibly a male writer who would come along later and want to attribute that sort of um, weighty passage to a young girl. That's, I don't know, that's interesting, if nothing else, right? Well, it, that happens also in the Song of Miriam with, with the, the uh, Moses' sister. Right, right. She actually, I, I think you can make the case that she others and made one could argue maybe historically the the first two lines of the song of Miriam may well go back to Miriam uh, mm -hmm. and then you get this mm -hmm. whole flood of words and that's all been added and and mm -hmm. and um, but it's interesting that even in these ancient texts 
you, you've got a woman delivering all that. And, um, uh, and so you, you do have that in, in Jewish history. You've got women who, who can stand out, who are contrapuntal. And that's how Mary works in Luke. Uh, she's very different. But that, however, that message that she delivers is matched by the angelic host, the angelic army. So they, that, 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 the music that you hear, hear is picked up again. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's interesting. Other thoughts? Bob, anything to add on that? Um, no, I think, I, think he's, I think he's pretty much said what I would say in the limited time that we have. And yeah. as long as I have the camera, I'm going to abuse my privilege here by letting yes. you know yes. a wonderful book. The best book I've ever read about the birth stories is the one that I wrote. So <laughs> if you're in learning more than you possibly want to know, really, about the birth stories, uh, Born Divine, uh, you can get it from Paul Bridge Press. You can get it from Amazon. Uh, they make great stocking stuffers. So. Yeah, I, I, yes. I, I, I would agree. I'd agree. This is the best book on on the birth of Jesus. It really is. Yeah. And, um, and that kind of gets at, there have been a few questions that I haven't specifically addressed because we've kind of gotten to it a little bit tangentially around this, this idea of other sons of God narratives and how much would the authors have been aware of that and how much would have that been woven in. And you guys have touched on that a little bit, so I haven't addressed it specifically. Um, but for folks that have asked those questions that are maybe interested in mapping that a little bit more, I think that book would be a great resource. And when I send out the info on the rewatch and the replay and all that, I usually try to include all the resources that we talked about. So I'll for sure like link yeah. that as well. Yeah. 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 I saw a few right. questions flash up about this uh, idea that Mary was probably 13 or 14 at the time of the birth. Yeah. Yeah. The Gospels don't really say what, how old she was, but what we do have are our later stories written in the second, third, fourth centuries, uh, what we call infancy gospels, whole completely fanciful stories told to fill in all the gaps. And in one of those, you know, the idea, it says quite clearly that she was 14. Not that anybody knew, knew that, but that's important evidence as to what age people would have expected this kind of thing to have happened about what the age of a woman was for having her first child. So it really does tell us that their ideas of motherhood, you know, are pushed back much earlier. Basically, women were expected to bear children from as early as they could until they couldn't. Yeah. Uh, and in the ancient world, that was, that was their task. And so it would make sense that a woman would be uh, sort of given to a man in marriage, usually older, much older than herself. And who began to bear children as, as soon as she was fertile. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I want to, if I go into Matthew's story with Joseph, he's considered a just man, a dikos, good man. But what he's con contemplating is he finds out that she's pregnant and he's going to put her away silently, which right. means that he's not going to kick her out the front door, but he will kick her out. And what does that mean? It means that this. 13, 14 year old pregnant girl is going to be left to her own devices but because she can't go home. And that means she's either going to live on the street or she's going to prostitute herself. And that's a just man's options. And, that, and, and, and that's why the angel comes and Joseph changes his mind. That's another way of saying he changed his mind radically. Um, yeah. But it's a, there's a dark element to this. The issue of justice is a very precise one for Matthew, because yeah. he's, he's there alluding to a law in the book of Deuteronomy, I think it is. Yeah. is that if a woman is pregnant at the time of her betrothal, then the, the marriage is illegitimate. And so Joseph is worried that if she was pregnant when he was betrothed to her, that he, he cannot be her husband. That would be unjust. Yeah. It would be against yeah. the law for him to be that. Yeah. That's why the visit from the angel is so important to Matthew's story, because the angel tells him, this child is of God. Now, that's, it's very vague, and in Jewish uh, parlance, it refers back to stories in the Old Testament where women who cannot conceive end up doing so because of God. 
it doesn't mean um, that there was no human father, even though that's typically the, the meaning of it, because that's what Luke means. And people usually read Luke and Matthew sort of put, and they kind of combine them. Yeah. And, but in, in, the, in the Jewish world of Matthew, it's God's way of telling Joseph, I'm, gonna, I'm taking responsibility for this. This pregnancy is now under my jurisdiction. And mm -hmm. so you, you step up, you do what you're told, and that will fulfill the law. Yeah. It's, it's a very yeah. specific dilemma that Joseph is, is in at that, at that point. Yeah. And I feel like, and some people have raised this too, that in recent past, well, to my knowledge, maybe it was before this, but there has been some, some, I don't know, wonderings about how Mary was pregnant and was it perhaps that she could have been, you know, a victim of assault or rape or things like that. And so trying to explain away something that was traumatic by giving it this, um, this divine meaning as well may have been a factor. I don't know. It's something we just really don't know. It would right. not be implausible that that right. could be the case. And even, even though this would be very shocking to many, many Christians to think about Jesus being a product of rape. Uh, I think that's not nearly as shocking as the way he died. You know, he was tortured to death. Mm -hmm. and, and Christianity learned to take that into a larger context, that God redeemed that horrible death, that Jesus left the world at the, at the mercy, or the merciless mercy of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. He could leave the world that the world that way through an act of hideous violence, why should we be so uh, scandalized or horrified to think that Jesus could have entered the world through an act of violence in the mm -hmm. same way? Mm -hmm. and in fact, it, there's kind of a theological symmetry there, which uh, is worth thinking about. We can't prove it. Uh, in my book, I explore that every, every way from Sunday and come out with simply a guess as to what might have been a case because there's no way of knowing for sure because they, they we simply don't know yeah and there's one last quick question here that i think is interesting especially given some of the work of the seminars um that we don't have to get into in detail but i just want to put a pin in and maybe we can come back to you on a different um different round table but asking about mm -hmm. other ancient texts that would have talked about jesus birth that are not in the canon quote unquote as we know it and i know that um, that there's a lot of work in West Star being done around extra canonical texts and things like that. So I don't know if you have any thought, closing thoughts about that um, to leave with. Well, let me just read you the uh, titles to five of the chapters in, in my book. Oh, perfect. Okay, the Infancy Gospel of James, mm -hmm. the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, the history <laughs> of Joseph the Carpenter, which is a story about the birth of Jesus, mm -hmm. the Arabic Infancy gospel and the gospel of pseudo-Matthew. All of these are gospels from the early Christian centuries. They're all quite fanciful, but the fancifulness actually tells us important things about what people of the time would mm -hmm. have accepted as both plausible and sort of happy tellings of these stories. And they're wonderful. Like yeah. when Jesus goes in the infancy gospel, in the uh, Arabic gospel, when he goes to to uh, Egypt, the palm trees on the way, they bow down for, and, and do reverence. Mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. he, he, he ends up petting lions, he tames dragons. All of these are, are they really are children's stories in a, in, in a way, but they, they give us a real sense of how Christians tried to add to and appropriate these stories within a much larger and fuller and richer narrative context. Yeah. yeah. What are these dated roughly? The like some of the maybe the earliest ones of the of the extra canonical text uh, like that. The, we're talking late second to sixth century. Some some, yeah. some yeah. they were still being composed into the Middle Ages, into the into, oh, wow. into the nine yeah. hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. And and they, and everybody knew they were just making this stuff up. Right. And right. Yet, and yet these were Im incredibly popular. There, there's a, there's a great story in the Middle Ages about Jesus fasting in the desert. And his mother shows up with soup. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that one. You know, if you want a story about Mary, she's got the chicken soup and she brings it oh into the God. desert. Wonderful. That's hilarious. Yeah. It's amazing. All right, everybody, we are at the hour. So Art and Bob, thank you so much for the conversation and your wisdom and 
um, everyone else who had, as, was here and attending and listening and chatting and questioning. It's wonderful. Um, I know we didn't get to everything. And I will, like I said, when I, so I'll send out the update tomorrow with the link to the replay for folks who couldn't be here. But with that, I usually, and I will include um, Bob, the link to your book, and then some other questions that have come up that I've taken note of other resources that I know we have available um, already and other ideas that we can perhaps discuss for a round table or other content suggestions in the future. So um, I al also will always want to plug a membership with Westar. So if this has been meaningful and you are not officially part of, uh, part of Westar as a member, I would encourage you um, to consider that. And I'm going to put the link in the chat. It's just Westar Institute dot org slash membership hang on and i will get that right here um and then i'll include that obviously in the email as well so uh art and bob any closing thoughts to leave us with have a have a merry uh, christmas yeah yeah but, yeah <laughs> merry, merry christmas yes. and great yes merry all christmas right. and pageanting and all that good stuff so we will um be in touch uh, with info on this and then also be in touch about more opportunities for these conversations in the new year. So thanks again, everybody, and have a good night. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, you bet. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.